All right, so good morning. My name's Dr. Paul Mason, and I'm from Sydney. And today I'm going to talk to you about a protein that's found in plants called lectins and how they can have a massive impact on our health. And understanding lectins, I believe, fills in a massive chasm in conventional medicine when it comes to treating a myriad of chronic diseases. And certainly for me, understanding their impact has improved the care that I deliver to my patients. As with all of my lectures, nothing contained here within should constitute personal medical advice. So the story begins in 1976 in England, when nine schoolboys ate some kidney beans that had been soaked but not boiled. And within one and a half hours, all nine of them ended up with profuse diarrhoea and vomiting. And some of them had only consumed four kidney beans. And further illustrating the toxic potential of kidney beans is a diet containing only 1% kidney beans will kill a rat in two weeks. So the problem of uncooked kidney beans was considered so serious in England back in this period that the government started issuing written warning labels on uncooked kidney beans. So then that leaves us with the question, what on earth is in uncooked kidney beans that will do that? So this is a kidney bean plant here. It doesn't have any claws, it can't run away, so it's pretty defenceless. Well, you'd be wrong. It's not at the complete mercy of any caterpillar that wants to come along because it engages in some very potent chemical warfare. And the chemical warfare that plants use, one of them is called lectins. And the particular lectin contained in kidney beans is called phytohemagglutinin. And in fact, there's over 100 known sources of plant lectins, and many of these are toxic to humans. Each lectin is a protein with a unique structure, and it's a protein that has the ability to bind to carbohydrates. All of our cells in the body have these glycoproteins which protrude up from the cell membrane, and they contain a carbohydrate moiety on the end of it. And lectins can bind to that carbohydrate moiety. And that means lectins can therefore bind to our human cells. Now, lectins are resistant to cooking. In the case of red kidney beans, it's recommended that you should soak them for five hours and then boil them for at least 10 minutes to reduce the lectins to a less dangerous level. And as well as being heat stable, lectins are often very, very resistant to the normal digestive enzymes that we have lining our gut. And it's to the point where a lot of lectins provide no nutritional value at all. They're often excreted completely unchanged. And often on the way through the intestinal tract, these unchanged lectins can often bind to the walls of our intestine and do significant damage, including killing the cells. So the way to think about it is our intestinal tract is a hollow tube from mouth to anus. And ideally, it should allow absorption of nutrients across the wall while not allowing entry of any toxins. And the lining of the intestinal tract has this basic structure. Firstly, there's a mucus layer on top, indicated in green here. And then beneath that, you've got these epithelial cells which are joined together side by side by what are called tight junctions. And on top of the epithelial cells here, you'll see that little frill layer, and that's called microvilli. Now, on the very tip of these microvilli, we have something called a glycocalyx. And this has a glucose or a sugar or a carbohydrate component, which means that lectins can actually bind to this part of the intestinal membrane. So if we take something like wheat germaglutinin, that will actually bind to the internal lining of our gut and damage it. And that causes something called leaky gut. Now, once you've got this single layer of cells, if you then fold it in a way, you can get these finger-like projections here, which we now call villi. And this is what villi look like under an electron microscope. Now, coming back to the general function, of the gastrointestinal tract. If we had a toxin like a lectin, hopefully it would pass straight through us without being absorbed. 
But occasionally, we can ingest a toxin and we have leaky gut or intestinal permeability, which allows the toxin to actually enter the body. And this is a graph here that demonstrates the potential of these toxins, these lectins, to enter our body. So seven participants consumed 200 grams of peanuts. And this test was actually measuring the amount of peanut lectin within their blood. And you can see that within half an hour, the level started to rise. And within an hour, there was a significant amount of this lectin seen in the circulation. And the ability, remember, of these lectins to bind to the surface of cells means that after entering our circulation, they can actually bind to cells in many different organs, depending on what particular affinity the lectin has for a particular kind of cell. So this image was done from a study that was done on females with unexplained fertility. And this is a sample of the endometrium, the lining of the uterus. And what you can actually see is indicated by the arrows, is they're actually demonstrating soybean agglutinin, a lectin actually bound to some endometrial tissue. Now, unfortunately, the consumption of lectins in our diet is actually increasing significantly. So, in part, this is due to natural selection, uh, selective breeding, and genetic modification of crops, which tends to select for species that are naturally resistant to pesticides. And that natural resistance comes from lectins. So let's take a look at the specific health consequences that these lectins can have, beginning with obesity. Has anybody ever noticed that when they cut plant foods out of their diet, that they lost weight? Even if you're already on a low carbohydrate diet, so why is that? I know several people who have lost over 10 kilograms, and it's because lectins can stimulate the insulin receptor. Insulin is a hormone that stimulates fat storage, and lectins can stimulate this. This graph here is from a 1983 study, and it compared active fat storage between wheat germ agglutinin and insulin. So down the bottom here, this is what happened to fat storage when insulin alone was given. This is what happened to fat storage when insulin plus a lectin in the form of wheat germ agglutinin was given. And this is what happened when you just give lectin alone. And the point is that it stimulates the insulin receptor in a far more prolonged fashion than even does insulin. So this is a concern if you're trying to lose weight. But it's not only wheat germ agglutinin that has this ability. In the same study, they actually looked at two other lectins as well. And you can see ability to produce persistent lipogenesis, creating fat. And it seems like lectin can also impact on another hormone critical to fat storage. And this hormone is leptin with a P, not to be confused with lectin. And the hormone leptin is essential in regulating appetite, satiety, and energy balance. Have a look at these two mice. The one on the left has no leptin. Demonstrates the importance of leptin functioning effectively. And lectins, with a C, can actually bind to the leptin receptor and interfere with it, causing resistance. And this here is a study showing of another lectin concarnivalin A that leads to leptin resistance. And when we test this in animal studies using isochloric diets that simply eliminate lectins, it leads to significant weight loss in the animals. Now, what about reflux? We're all familiar with reflux. That's what happens when you have stomach acid in the stomach that ascends up the esophagus. It's often called heartburn. Well, you might be surprised to learn that lectins can also cause this, because they can stimulate excess acid production. So this is a mast cell here, and it can secrete a chemical called histamine. And if it secretes histamine, that then leads to acid production in the stomach. And lectins can come along and bind to these molecules on the outside of the mast cell, called IgE molecules, and that stimulates the histamine release. And through this mechanism, you can actually increase the acid. 
And this is one study where it showed a dramatic reduction in the acid levels in the esophagus within six days of starting a low-carbohydrate diet. And that's simply because when you go on a low-carb diet, you often cut out the lectin-rich grains and cereals. So they actually had probes down into the esophagus that were sitting there for 24 hours and measuring the acid level constantly. And you can see that in a matter of six days, there was a significant reduction in the acidity within the esophagus. And this is why symptoms of reflux often improve incredibly rapidly when we go on a plant-free diet. Now, I'd like to make a very important point here. So far, I've only talked about plant lectins. But lectins actually do exist in animal foods as well, and other foods. The reason I'm only talking about plant lectins is that they're far more likely to be problematic. It doesn't mean that animal-based lectins can't be problematic. It's just they're so much less likely to do it. In this study here, this was a study looking at histamine release from 16 different lectins, and you can see the four that had the most significant response were all plant-based lectins. So that's why I'm tending to focus on them. Now, I'd just like to focus or we'll turn our attention to a condition called Parkinson's disease. Now, this is a movement disorder. I'm sure you've all heard of it. You're familiar with it. You end up with a tremor. You end up with rigidity and uh, slowed movement. And there's evidence now that this is caused by lectins. You see, if you ingest a lectin, and this sounds crazy, it can actually ascend up to the brain by travelling along nerves. And the nerve in particular is called the vagus nerve. So theoretically, if that was true, if you just simply cut the nerve, you would interrupt the highway which the lectins are sent to the brain and you should be able to reduce the risk of Parkinson's disease. Makes sense, right? So they did it. So this is an example. This is a picture of the two vagus nerves. And when you cut them, it's called a vagotomy. So in one study, it was published in 2015, they compared every patient in Denmark who had this procedure between 1977 and 1995. And this is what they found. They found that by cutting the vagus nerves, the risk of developing Parkinson's disease dropped by 47%. And then, This is a more recent study that was able to actually confirm the mechanism. It was able to demonstrate that lectins were actually able to travel to the neurons in the brain which are affected in Parkinson's disease. And this graphic here shows the ingested P lectin sitting on top of a neuron in the brain that makes dopamine. This is the problem in Parkinson's disease. So now I want to turn our attention to autoimmune disease. And in autoimmune disease, the body attacks its own tissues. And the particular tissues attack determine what specific autoimmune disease it is. Because you've got a choice. There's heaps of them, more than you can poke a stick at. And different examples of them might include different types of inflammatory arthritis. You might have pernicious anemia. You might even have multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, lupus, and the list goes on. But the point is, that all autoimmune diseases are characterised by the body's immune system attacking itself. And one of the defining features is called autoantibodies. So this Y-shaped structure here in the middle is what we call an antibody, and it's one of the main features of the immune system. And normally, antibodies are used to defend against foreign invaders, pathogens. If you have a bacteria, the antibody will have a strong affinity for the bacteria, and when it attaches to it, that then stimulates or initiates an immune response that will lead to the eventual destruction of that bacteria. And if this was a healthy cell here, well, hopefully that has no affinity for it. So on the surface of the cell here, you see what's called an antigen. That's a particular molecular identifying feature, either on a cell or a bacteria. And the specificity of that antigen and the receptor on the antibody will depend whether they bind together or not. And in the case of autoimmune diseases, antibodies have receptors that can actually bind to healthy cells. And then that can lead to your healthy tissues starting to be destroyed. And the presence of these autoantibodies is actually what I use to diagnose autoimmune diseases. It's one of the major things I use. And 
there's over 100 different antibodies that I can now test for back home in Australia when I'm trying to diagnose an autoimmune disease. Now, leaky gut, this intestinal permeability that allows lectins to enter into the circulation is a key contributor to autoimmune disease. And gluten is one of the major causes of leaky gut. So about 80% of the total protein contained within wheat is gluten. And that's significant, but just from one fact, because it means that 80% of the protein is useless in wheat, so you're not getting as much protein as you think you are. But the gluten is also very damaging to the intestinal barrier. So this graph here demonstrates the intestinal barrier as assessed by something called transepithelial electrical resistance. The higher the line, the better. The top line shows barrier function in celiac intestinal cells that haven't been exposed to gluten. When we expose them to gluten, this happens. And you can see it happens rapidly within 15 minutes. And in people with celiac disease, this increase in intestinal permeability will persist for up to a week. But here's the thing that a lot of people don't know. It's not only celiacs who are affected by gluten. This top line here is non-celiac cells not exposed to gluten. This one here, non-celiac cells exposed to gluten. There's still a significant impediment to intestinal barrier function. Gluten impairs the intestinal barrier in everybody, not just celiacs. Now let's have a look exactly how gluten can do this. So the top layer in green here represents the mucus layer, and the bottom layer here in blue is something called the lamina propria. This is uh, the, the tissue layer of the intestines where the immune system lives. You've got blood vessels and lymphatic vessels and a few other things kicking around there. And this here is gluten. Now, when it gets ingested, it can get broken down partially into these smaller parts called gliadin, but no further. And this gliadin then can bind to a special receptor called CXCR3. And once it binds to that, that leads to signalling within the cell that produce, leads to the production of a molecule called zonulin. And this zonulin can then come and act on a receptor which leads to the breakdown of these proteins here called the tight junction or gap junction which actually hold the cells together. And when that gets disrupted, the cells are able to physically separate. And this is what causes leaky gut. This is what leaky gut is. And then these lectins that have been ingested as well as any bacteria that might exist in the intestines, can actually pass between the cells and get down to the lamina propria where it gets exposed to the immune system and it's able to interact with the immune system. Now, because lectins are essentially foreign particles, we often mount an immune response to get them, so we often end up developing antibodies that will target them. So let's say here in purple that that's a lectin. And if you have a look at the antigen on the surface in green, you can see that it's the same as part of an antigen on a healthy cell. So that means if we develop an antibody response against the lectin, we can also develop an antibody response against a healthy cell. And this is called molecular mimicry. And this is thought to underpin most autoimmune disease. Now, lectins aren't the only cause of molecular mimicry in autoimmune disease. We can also have cell wall fragments from bacteria that look very similar to our healthy cells that will trigger this molecular mimicry type response. And certainly this has been uh, shown to be uh, the case in rheumatoid arthritis and a couple of other very specific inflammatory conditions. Now, in addition to molecular mimicry, these bacteria can also exacerbate symptoms of inflammatory conditions like arthritis because they secrete toxins called lipopolysaccharides. Now, you can see dotting the surface of the bacterium here and circled here 
uh, what's called the lipopolysaccharides. And when the bacteria enter the circulation, they're then able to release these lipopolysaccharides into the circulation, which then will stimulate inflammation. And it stimulates inflammation because the lipopolysaccharide can bind to this receptor up here called the toll-like receptor 4, and that then initiates an inflammatory cascade, um, which ends up having a whole lot of deleterious downstream effects. But here's a key point. And I often hear people talking about the importance of lipopolysaccharides in inflammation, but they're not all the same. Some lipopolysaccharides will stimulate this toll-like receptor, and some won't. Some will block it. You can have pro-inflammatory lipopolysaccharides, and you can have anti-inflammatory ones as well. So, in general, lipopolysaccharide produced by this group of bacteria, the Bacteroidetes phylum, is actually quite inhibitory of this inflammatory cascade. And reassuringly, when we're in good health, it's this phylum of bacteria which produces most of our lipopolysaccharide. And further, if we're on a healthy diet, often a ketogenic diet, a high saturated fat and animal protein diet, those diets have actually been shown to increase the proportion of Bacteroidetes, which is actually falls within the phylum of the, uh, uh, the larger phylum that produces these anti-inflammatory lipopolysaccharides. So a healthy diet might actually increase the amount of lipopolysaccharides, but it will produce anti-inflammatory lipopolysaccharides. And this is a point that's often missed in the research. Now, one of the conditions that's linked to type 1 diabetes is uh, one of the is gluten consumption, rather. So if you consume gluten, it's been shown that your risk of developing type 1 diabetes, gluten, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, these other clusters of autoimmune diseases is significantly increased. And this recent study encapsulates that risk with maternal gluten consumption, looking at the risk of developing type 1 diabetes in offspring. So they looked at over 100,000 pregnancies in Denmark, and what they found was there was a reliable linear increased risk of type 1 diabetes with gluten consumption. And for the highest group of gluten consumption, the risk of your offspring developing type 1 diabetes was doubled. And then we have papers like this, which indicate that Commencing a gluten-free diet soon after diagnosis of type 1 diabetes can significantly alter the prognosis. So this study looked at what happened to a boy who was placed on a strict gluten-free diet soon after diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, and it compared him to a, a group of 21 other children as a control. And what you can see, here he is down in red, his insulin level, his insulin usage was far, far less, and his blood sugar control was far, far better. It had him in the sub-6 group rarefied air. And his diabetes was still in remission 20 months later when this study was actually published. Now, just a little bit of a semi-related point I'd like to raise. We cannot assume that only children develop type 1 diabetes. We don't call it that in adults. We use the term latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, which is a pretty cumbersome name, but it's essentially the same. It's diabetes of autoimmune origin. And in fact, up to 14% of cases of type 2 diabetes, which are diagnosed in adults, actually have an autoimmune component. And this is huge because it means there's a potential intervention that we might be able to do for these other people that we're missing out on. And unfortunately, we very, very rarely test for autoimmune diabetes in adults, despite the fact that the chances are more than 1 in 10 of type 2 diabetics actually have this condition. And it doesn't matter if you're overweight and have other metabolic risk factors, you still could have this autoimmune type of adult onset diabetes. So it's probably time to pause for a moment and ask why not everybody has an autoimmune disease? Because we've all consumed lectins in the past, right? 
So I find it helpful to apply the Swiss cheese model of accident causation here. And that states that accidents only happen when deficiencies in the defences line up. So if we have a think about autoimmune diseases, you need to pick the wrong parents. <laughs> you probably need to have some aspect of intestinal permeability, which may or may not be triggered by lectin consumption. And then you may also need to be consuming lectins or have some other kind of uh, antigenic stimulus like certain bacteria within your gut. So unless all of those three line up, then chances are you probably won't develop an autoimmune disease. But for people that have picked the wrong parents, these next two layers become very important. So let's pay a bit more attention to intestinal permeability or leaky gut now. So this chart here was derived from a genome association study looking at inflammatory bowel disease. And it found that having inflammatory bowel disease or the genetics for it increased the risk of 23 other conditions, most of them autoimmune diseases. So uh, this should suggest that there's something about inflammatory bowel disease which is inherently associated with increased intestinal permeability that is problematic in autoimmune disease. So let's start with a few factors of things that we can actually do to reduce or increase intestinal permeability. Other risk factors. Alcohol's a big one. So clearly here you can see that intestinal permeability is far higher consuming ethanol than not. What about anti-inflammatory medications? Likewise, this is diclofenac, this is the active ingredient found in Voltaren. So it's been understood for a long, long time that taking anti-inflammatory medication increases intestinal permeability. And to add insult to injury, these are the medications that doctors often prescribe to people with joint pain for, in a group of arthritis called the seronegative spondylarthropathies or even rheumatoid arthritis, these other conditions that as a root cause will often have intestinal permeability contributing. Now, let's have a look at uh, processed foods. So, they're full of a myriad of ingredients, but they're always homogenised. And the reason is because they contain emulsifiers. And this study here, it was done in mice, but it actually compared a couple of emulsifiers at 1% of their food intake. So it wasn't big. Compared to the amount of emulsifiers that an average person on a processed food diet consumes, this is actually quite modest. But what you can see, the addition of emulsifiers in the second or the third column here leads to a significant thinning of the mucus, shown in green, and it actually allows increased bacterial penetration of the mucus. So you can see the red dots, they're the bacteria. They're now able to get very close to the intestinal wall. And if we actually have a look at what the consequences are of this in the same study, we find that exposure to the emulsifiers increased volitional food intake. We didn't tell the mice to eat more. They just did. So the second and third columns there. And predictably, this then led to a significant increase in fasting blood glucose levels. And perhaps even more predictably, the mice got fatter. The authors of this paper basically said it was emulsifier-induced metabolic syndrome. So uh, anybody still uh, clinging to the calories in, calories out hypothesis? <laughs> but even those on a ketogenic diet shouldn't get too comfortable right now. This is cream. And it contains these emulsifiers. And they're also found in things like coconut cream too. So please check your labels. And so they're not often uh, stated. So polysorbate 80. It's nice if they say that, but it's often just listed as E433. So uh, check your labels if you're having processed foods. Polyethylene glycol is another substance that can really thin the mucus layer. So that's often used as an anti-foaming food additive, or it's often used to manage or treat constipation in things called Mobicol. That's actually made of polyethylene glycol. And in this study here, we can see what happened 
when you add polyethylene glycol to a sugar mixture in mice. See how it impacts the thickness of the mucus layer there. Now, another additive in food which has the potential to damage the intestinal barrier is one that might surprise you. And that's titanium dioxide nanoparticles. Now, we're used to talking about titanium dioxide in sunscreens when we worry about it, but you can probably relax because it doesn't seem to penetrate to the deeper layers of the skin, to the dermis, where it can actually interact with the immune system. But if you eat it, that's a different story. And it's an approved food additive. And you might well be eating it. So it's often in sweets and chewing gums. And studies have actually shown in animals that regular consumption for a period of 10 days will actually lead to detectable accumulations in organs. So what we've got here is a stick of sugar-free and gluten-free chewing gum. And as an aside, it's so effective at penetrating the gut barrier that drug companies use it um, for drug delivery. They try and complex a drug molecule with a nanoparticle because they know the nanoparticle can actually get past the intestinal wall. Now we move to pesticides. And pesticides of all sorts have been associated with a whole lot of autoimmune disorders, neurological defects, developmental disorders. And what we can see here is a, a study on pesticides. So you can see the, in green, these are tight junctions, so proteins that hold the epithelial cells together. And they're being highlighted by something called immunofluorescence. And this is a sample that hasn't been exposed to pesticides. And this is a sample from a mouse that has been exposed to pesticides. Tight junctions are gone. And associated with this loss of tight junctions is increased passage of bacteria into the circulation. So this is from the same study, and this graph demonstrates the percentage of rats following pesticide exposure who had different classes of bacteria in their circulation. So the grey bars demonstrate the rats exposed to pesticides, and the white bars demonstrate the rats who weren't. And here's the problem. Many of our foodstuffs are actually contaminated with pesticide residues. This is one that might surprise a lot of people. We've all heard about people moving to the mountains and the inflammatory bowel disease got better or something like that. And pollution may be to blame. So particularly the really small particles called the PM10s. And they've actually been shown to increase gut permeability. And in this graph here, in control mice, we have a and um, mice exposed to PM10, you can see there's a significant increase in intestinal permeability, especially in the colon. And the reason it's worse in the colon is probably because the residue spends the longest time in that part of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and they can also induce free radical damage, the, uh, which then has a whole nut another list of consequences in terms of oxidative stress and uh, free radical production. What about chemicals found in plastic? You've all probably heard of BPA. And we know that BPA is damaging to the gut lining. But it's being uh, taken out of the, the food packaging now, right? So that's got to be a good thing. Well, it's being replaced by something called BPS. It basically has the same effect, we think except it hasn't really been studied. Um, but now, 80% of Americans actually have detectable levels of BPS in their urine. So maybe stay away from plastics. Now, um, let's have a look at things that you can do, things that are good. Now, the consumption of fats has actually been shown to significantly improve the function of the mucus layer in the intestines. And the effect was significant. So when we compared it, um, we had 200 nanometer spheres, and we measured the passage of those across a barrier. The consumption of fats immediately preceding that reduced the passage by at least 10 times, and possibly more than 100 times. There's something else we can take, possibly, and that's called glutamine. This is one of the most abundant amino acids in the bodies. And 
it's used as the main fuel source by the intestinal cells. And that significantly contributes to the structural integrity of the enterocytes. And in animals, if we give a mouse indomethacin, we can see a lot of the cells die. And when we give them indomethacin plus glutamine, we see that it's restored to baseline. So as yet, human trials, and there have been a couple, they haven't quite had as dramatic results. Um, but I'm still, uh, I'm still waiting. I suspect it probably will be beneficial. Bovine clostrum. So clostrum is the, the milk. This is the milk that the uh, cows are making in the first few days after birth. And this is a randomised controlled trial on seven male volunteers who took 50 milligrams of indomethacin three times a day for five days. And what they found was that before they took endomethacin, and after they took endomethacin, if they had clostrum, there was no change in their intestinal permeability. But if they didn't take the colostrum and they took a, uh, a surrogate, a, a whey protein, then there was a significant increase. And it's thought to be that there's growth factors in the colostrum, in particular transforming growth factor beta, which is thought to support the intestinal wall. Now, by definition, lectins can bind to sugars because remember they're carbohydrate protein. So the theory is that perhaps if we're consuming lectins, we can consume sugars at the same time. And these sugars will serve as a decoy and bind to the lectins before they can hit our intestinal wall and do the damage. And what you can see here in this study on mice is that if they were giving a lectin on its own, there was a significant increase in intestinal permeability. But when they gave a co-consumption of sugar plus the lectin, the damage was reduced. And there's also theories that giving glucosamine um, supplement will do the same. So we can actually do a decoy. Now, the really interesting thing to consider here is that if you're a vegetarian on a low-carbohydrate diet, then you may actually be getting more damage from the lectins than somebody still, you know, uh, chortling down all the Tim Tams and the whatever sugary treats you guys have over here. Now, lecithin is a unique substance. So this is often used as a natural emulsifier in foods, but it's a good guy. So it actually contains something called phosphatidylcholine, and more than 70% of the phospholipids in our mucous membrane is made as phosphatidylcholine. And orally ingested lecithin has actually been shown to adhere to the mucus layer and strengthen it. And in one randomised control trial, it led to a more than 50% improvement in symptoms in more than 90% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And this was in a population that was refractory to steroids and other medications. And in fact, 80% of patients who were on steroids were able to have them withdrawn because of the lecithin. Now, we've already seen a significant association between bacterial populations in the gut and intestinal permeability. So the question is, well, can we replace can we supplement with bacterial populations in the form of probiotics? And several strains of bacteria have actually been shown to be beneficial to the intestinal lining. And this includes Lactobacillus plantarum, which is found in a medical grade probiotic supplement called VL, VSL3 that we often use in inflammatory bowel disease. One of the issues is though, the need to nourish any introduced bacteria. If the food supply or the nutrients available for the bacteria which we introduce is not favourable to it, it's likely to be outcompeted by other bacteria, and that just means that we're, we're going to need to have a continual delivery. Now, as you know, there's some debate about whether we should have dairy foods. And a lot of the debate goes around whether we should have A1 or A2 proteins. So basically, a1 protein, which is found in some milks, 
can lead to the formation of a peptide called BCM7. And this has certain opiate type effects that can bind to opiate receptors in the brain, um, possibly lead to cognitive dysfunction. And it can often, it's thought, it might also cause intestinal inflammation and several other things. And there is some studies that actually show comparing A1 and A2 milks that eliminating the A1 protein led to a reduction in systemic inflammation and improving cognitive performance and several other things. But there is a take home point here because putting that to one side, both the milks still led to a low grade inflammatory response the type of which is often seen in conditions what we call atopy, allergic type conditions, asthmatic type conditions. So it's probably reasonable here to err on the side of caution. If you have a genetic susceptibility for developing allergies or autoimmune disease, then avoiding cow's milk for the first period of your life is certainly highly recommended and possibly ongoing. So just to wind up, the question is, with all of this theory, does avoiding these plant-based lectins actually help autoimmune conditions? And the answer is yes. This was a study that was published in 2017 and it looked at a cohort of 15 patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And remember, inflammatory bowel disease was at the centre of this diagram of all the other autoimmune diseases. And the average duration of inflammatory bowel disease in the study participants was 19 years. And seven of the 15 actually relied on expensive, what we call biological therapy, monoclonal antibodies to try and help control their disease. So they were placed on a diet that was called the autoimmune protocol. So they avoided gluten, refined sugar, grains, legumes, nightshade vegetables, because they're a they carry a lot of lectins, a lot of people don't realise. So your potato, your capsicum, or you guys call them bell peppers, your eggplants, tomatoes, chilies, very rich in lectins. So we, we cut out the nightshades. Um, no dairy, no eggs, no coffee, no alcohol, no nuts, no seeds, no food additives. And they also gave them a little bit of lifestyle advice, you know, optimise your sleep, exercise a little bit. So what were the results? Well. 11 of the 15 subjects had clinical remission by six weeks, and they maintained it for the duration of the study. And remember, the average duration of inflammatory bowel disease entering the study was 19 years. Now, by virtue of the small study size, the laboratory measurements didn't reach statistical significance, but they did show a trend for improvements. Take, for example, fecal colprotectin. This is a marker of bowel inflammation that gets shed off into the faeces, and it's a very reliable test of inflammatory bowel disease. And in actual fact, it's one of my preferred tests for this condition that I do in the clinic. And the average reduction was from 471 to 112. Now, it didn't reach statistical significance by virtue of the small sample size, but certainly if there was reductions like that, I'd consider that clinically significant. And these kind of results mirror what the results that I actually see in my patients. I think we should wind up there, so thank you.